This video is sponsored by Paleo Games. More about them at the end of the video. I'm here to ask you all some important questions. What if Battlesmith Artificer, but with bones? What if instead of a robot bear you can't customize, you got a super customizable golem composed of the remains of your fallen enemies? What if you took your monster hunter character and put that in D&D? The answer to all of those questions is the artificer subclass called Bone Sculptor. If you played the Battlesmith Artificer and were underwhelmed by it, then this is the subclass you need to try. Seriously, Battlesmith, you let me make a robot bear, don't let me customize the bear, and then forget that bear exists for 12 levels. Battlesmith is the kind of guy who would leave their dog in the car with the windows rolled up on a hot summer day. This is such a cool subclass that I was the one who reached out to Paleo Games, not the other way around. I was like, hey, would you pay me to talk about this thing I was already going to talk about? And they were like, shit, okay. So let's talk about this dino-boned dude. Level 3. You get Grim Harvest at this level, which lets you harvest resources from slain creatures. Stuff like bones, hide, feathers, claws, wallet, pants. It even comes with a table detailing how long it would take to harvest these materials and how many resources you can get from a creature based on its size. But what are you supposed to do with all these posthumously donated materials? That's where its other level 3 feature, Melder of Flesh and Bone, comes in. It lets them make weapons and armor during a long rest. Unlike Stinky Battlesmith, who needs a fancy schmancy forge to make armor and weapons, Bone Sculptor can make a halberd on the side of the highway with nothing more than some leather straps, some leftover barbecue ribs, and a deer skull. Now that may not sound impressive because most players start with armor and weapons. Oh cool, you made me a set of bone chain mail. That's so neat. No, you could keep it. I'd rather keep my metal chain mail and not risk catching anthrax. Thanks. <laughs> Here's the thing though, they can make breastplates, half plates, and even plate armor. It's not that resource expensive to make. If you slay two large creatures, you should have enough material to make full plate armor. That's a normal adventuring day for most people. Or just go on a hunting trip when you have some downtime and hunt two big deer, or one Spinosaurus, or go grave robbing. They aren't using their bones. Oh right, I forgot to mention. There is no discrimination on what you harvest material from. So you can have armor made of dinosaur bones, dragon bones, the bones of the annoying NPC you really don't like. So after a few combats or premeditated murders, you can upgrade yourself to a breastplate made of four furs, two feathers, and one human pelvis. Then give your fighter full plate armor made entirely of goat hooves. Slay six bandits and you get the dragon bone armor from Skyrim. Melder of Flesh and Bones is basically the everyone gets better AC earlier feature. Also, did you know bone armor was a real thing people wore in the past? Some people found armor composed of reindeer bones in Siberia. It looked like this. So next time one of your killjoy friends says bone armor is unrealistic, you could tell him it's not too far-fetched. I mean, granted, you wanted your armor to look like this and not this, and this seems less practical, but realism in a game with magic dragons is pretty silly, so I say go full Skyrim armor with it. Also at level 3, they get the Spare the Dying cantrip and some free spells, that's great, we- <laughs> hold on a minute, wait, wait, hold on. They get Speak with Animals? Really? <laughs> is there any animal that would want to talk to you when your weapons and armor are made of their cousins? I feel like they might have second thoughts on talking to a guy who looks like the monster at the end of a horror movie, but whatever. <laughs> Next up we have... Oh, level 4. Uh, alright, a little unconventional, but okay. Uh, level 4 gives us Butcher, which lets you gain proficiency in one weapon type and lets you use intelligence instead of strength or dex for attack and damage rolls if it's with a weapon you made. Nerd strength. Got it. Give us all your money. Ah, leave us alone, you hooligans. Hi -ya. He fights like a tiger. Honestly, I would just give this to them at level three. Battlesmith gets the same thing at level three, so it's not crazy. Yes, I understand this is a lot of features at level three. Not only is it a lot of text, it also comes with two big info tables, but most of these are passive abilities or out of combat abilities. It's not that crazy to add one more thing, Plus, moving Butcher to level 3 gives them an ability to use in combat. Speaking of combat, level 5 is a level I am very excited about. At this level, you get Construct of Flesh, which lets you create an undead construct composed of the skin and bones of your fallen enemies. Not sure why it's called Construct of Flesh when it takes four bones, four hides, and some combination of scales, claws, and feathers to make. Not really parts of the body I and many others would consider flesh. I would have called it bony crony, but that's just me. It's still a really good ability. It allows you to make an undead companion that looks a little something like this.
Wow, that is really cool. Wait, how did you make this with only four bones? First of all, this construct actually scales in power as you level up. Thank the big bone father in the sky. Second, when you create your bony crony, you can choose one ability and one attack from a sizable collection of options. Here are just a few fun combinations. You could combine Volant and Noxious Spit, which would give this thing a fly speed and a ranged acid spit attack. You could combine Nimble and Gruesome Claw, which lets it run faster and every time it hits a creature, they have to make a save or be frightened of your construct. Basically just a realistic Velociraptor. If you give this guy hands, if you don't have any hands, maybe pay a visit to that annoying NPC, you could combine Arboreal and Vicious Bite. Arboreal gives it a climb speed and advantage on athletics checks, so you can grapple a guy, sink your teeth into him, and fill his body with poison. And don't worry about the poison damage. It's still a good amount of damage, even without the poison. It's like a squirrel, a snake, and Skeletor combined to make a WWE wrestler I desperately want to see in real life. There are a bunch of cool combos you can do, but there's more to this stat block than what immediately meets the eye. The Bone Buddy is a medium-sized creature, so if you are a small creature, this thing can act as your mount. But wait, there's more. You might be wondering why I picked a Plasmoid to represent the subclass. For those out of the loop, a Plasmoid is an official D&D race that is basically a jelly person. It's like if an amoeba wished upon a star to be a real boy. Okay, so why a Plasmoid? Why pick the race with zero bones to represent the bone subclass? Because you are allowed to create this construct and make it look however you wish. So you could install a solid sphere big enough to hold your Plasmoid character inside the construct, and you could leave a single opening an inch wide for your plasmoid to hop in and out of because they can squeeze through openings at least an inch wide. If you really wanted to seal up that inch wide opening, you could make a bone sword with a handle and guard that perfectly blocks off that hole and your plasmoid could hold the sword in place from the inside of the sphere. Do you see where I'm going with this? You can make your femur fellow mount into a mobile shelter, giving you perfect cover and unable to be targeted directly with spells that require sight. And when it's the plasmoid's turn, they push their sword up, pop out through the one inch hole, attack a creature, go back into the sphere and then seal the hole. You don't even need to pop your entire body out, just your sword arm and the part the plasmoid uses to see. Imagine seeing a dino skeleton with a slime tentacle sticking out of its back, waving around a bone sword like a spooky weed whacker of doom. If I saw that in real life, I would think the end times were upon us. One of the horsemen of the apocalypse is here. The bad part is I am very unsure which horseman it is. If we are using the squeezing rules in the absolute worst case scenario, it would take 10 feet of movement to poke out of the sphere and another 10 feet of movement to return to the sphere. I think that's a bit harsh for poking a head in an arm out of a hole, but I figure I'd make a case against any DMs that says this can't work at all. If you do use the Unseen Horseman of Doom strat, I recommend taking the Robust ability, which gives your Coccyx Compadre more health and more AC. I also recommend the Mighty Gore attack, which knocks enemies prone. So you can ready your action to attack a creature after your Tibia teammate and knocks the enemy prone, then you attack the enemy with advantage. There are probably a ton of combinations I have not even thought of. It's so customizable and you can really make a variety of creatures and you're not locked into one design either. You can change it however you want during a long rest. Also at level five, you get improved crafting, which makes it so any armor or weapons you crafted using your Melder of Flesh and Bone ability become plus one items, which is great. I'd also argue that means your Patella Pal also gets a plus one to its attacks and damage rules as well. Is it not a weapon as well? If I can make a plus one dagger from a single fang and this creature has many sharp fangs, wouldn't it have a plus one mouth? Hey, what that mouth do? Going further than that, did you know any creature can attune to a magic item? It's not just a player character thing. So maybe you can put an artificer infusion onto its teeth and it could attune to its now magic teeth as one does. So you could give this to your cuspid comrade and have poisonous laser fangs that blind your enemies. I love the insane sentences that come out of D&D sometimes, man. I like to imagine you're engraving runes directly onto their teeth. That or some industrial grade toothpaste. Also, I'm just saying you could make armor for your mandible mate to increase its AC even further. We got rules for putting armor on mounts. It's called barding. We can make this work. You know what this bony sit against God needs? 
More bones! What's neat about the improved crafter feature is that it has scaling. Your weapons and armor become plus two at level nine and plus three at level 15. Level nine gives us improved construct of flesh, which lets you choose another ability for your construct of flesh and lets it attack twice instead of once. <laughs> This is what I always wanted from a pet owner subclass. Don't give me the power-ups, give them to my Pokemon. Make it the strongest dog. Good dog. Level 15 does more of the same and it is great. You get to pick a second attack for Bones Malone. Each attack does an additional 2d6 necrotic damage. Its AC goes up by two and its maximum HP goes up by 60 points. Not only do you get better stats for your corpse colleague, but you get extra options in combat. Take f***ing notes, Battlesmith! Your buff video is just going to be me pointing to the bone sculptor! Third party publishers got the sauce, man. Oh, there's something else you get at level 15. Let's see what it is. Body modification. It lets you incorporate your armor and weapons into your own flesh. Whoa, that is intense. The weapon can be concealed in your body and can be drawn out with a bonus action. Oh, that's, that's cool. It's like a Wolverine or Baraka from Mortal Kombat type situation. That's really, wait, what kind of weapons can they make again? Oh, how long are halberds normally? And a small creature is around three feet tall and they can store two five foot long halberds inside their body. I don't, what? So I asked Paleo Games directly and they said they do not use magic to make the weapons smaller. My guess is they store their weapons in their cheeks like a chipmunk. But you know what? I think it's best we leave it up to the individual to figure out. Leave a comment down below on how you would store a weapon that is taller than you inside your body. I'm sure all the comments will be very, very wholesome and tame. I look forward to reading them. So if you can't already tell, I really like this subclass, but I did find one thing that could be improved upon. Once you make all your weapons and armor and skeletal sidekick, there's no need to harvest materials from slain enemies, which feels so wrong from a guy who walks around looking like this. So I made a feature that will encourage players to continue resource collecting. It's called Ghastly Gadgets. To put it briefly, it lets you make consumables with the parts you collect from corpses. It lets you make grappling hooks, extended skeleton arms, explosive exoskeleton armor, and many more. These ghastly gadgets are balanced to be used at any level. These things are a one-time use and will give you a slight edge in battle. It's nothing crazy, but it will help you, your teammates, and your cadaverific confidant. Bone Sculptor's pretty cool. If you think it's cool too, consider checking out Dr. Drolin's Dictionary of Dinosaurs. It is a 304 page book full of dinosaurs. This book was written by actual paleontologists. So not only do you get a ton of cool monster stat blocks, the book tells you how the dinosaurs probably behaved, their anatomy, and where they lived. This is an educational book as well as a way to throw a Spinosaurus at your players. Don't think dinosaurs are cool enough? Don't worry you sad curmudgeon. The book has got you covered. There are optional rules for each dinosaur to make them magical. My personal favorite is the Bone Wars feature. It makes it so every single iguanodon on the planet has had explosives magically inserted into their body so they explode on death. They got playable dino races with entire societies and a massive table of mutations to give to your dinos or make a new dino entirely. It's got rules for taming dinosaurs. How does backgrounds, feats, magic items, a very trippy druid subclass, and of course, the Bone Sculptor. If you want a copy of Dr. Drolin's Dictionary of Dinosaurs for 10% off, use my discount code BONE10 at paleogames.com. But that discount is only for a limited time. So use discount code BONE10 at paleogames.com to get 10% off. Again, get 10% off this book with discount code BONE10 at paleogames.com. Also, they are starting a Kickstarter to do a Pathfinder 2E conversion of this book. So if you're interested, check it out on their Kickstarter. To get the rules for Ghastly Gadgets, you can find the link to them in the description. Shout out to the patrons, Panko6, Beefmaster, Semi-Controlled Chaos, BuddyB31, Christopher Cook, Fusro Dog, Hayden Tisthammer, Manifestering, Poggers Extreme, Zachalu, Swampy Begee, Volum, and Zethius. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you.